Hey guys, it's Dr. McGlasson. I hope that you're all doing well. I just wanted to take a few minutes today to go through this um, Obama stimulus handout that I had put here in Canvas because a lot of times people, when they're going along with the video, yeah, that all sounds good, but then when they're faced with actual numbers, they're not sure what it is that I want them to do with it. So I just wanted to take a look at this five-point assignment with you. So on the previous page in Canvas, I had given you data for the U.S., and I asked you if you would take a look at it and say, all right, when do you think you would have been worried about the macroeconomic goal? Because early 2000, uh, early early 2020, you probably would not have been all that concerned because unemployment's low and we've got some growth and our GDP is very large and uh, inflation indicates that prices are steady. So right now we weren't all that worried. I mean, we're probably going to be worried with the COVID effects, but that's a story for another day. But if you look back at those numbers, what most students are going to tell me is they would have been worried around 2008. You started seeing negative growth. You started seeing, you know, the, the economy shrinking. You're seeing unemployment almost doubling within a year or two. So that's when they were concerned. Well, what do you do if the economy is shrinking and you have a lot of unemployment? Do you use expansionary policy or do you use contractionary policy? Because contractionary policy will slow the economy down even further and probably cause it to shrink more. Um, contractionary policy is usually if we think the economy is moving too fast, if we think that we might run into the danger of uh, inflation that's too high. You want to slow it down with contractionary. But when what you're worried about is the growth. You want more growth and you want... Uh, more jobs, then you're probably going to want expansionary policies. So you're looking at 2008, it's an election year, and you get a new president in office. He is inaugurated on January 1st, 2009. Let me get myself out of the way here. Uh, and then eight days later, Congress approves a stimulus package, the likes of which we had never seen before. $820 billion in tax cuts and special spending packages. So what I want you to do with this is to go through each of these categories and just be very methodical about it and say, okay, do I think that that's going to affect spending or production? Is it demand or supply? Because you're going to go back and use the aggregate demand, aggregate supply tools that we just learned about in section, <laughs> it's the cat in section four to say, all right, when somebody proposes a policy, can I tell what effect that might have on the economy? So here was the policy that got put into place. Section one talks about tax cuts and these tax cuts, let me put this in draw mode here. Okay. Uh, tax cuts, payroll tax holiday, that means that you get to keep more money in your paycheck. It's like you get to keep your social security taxes instead of paying them for a couple of months. If that's the case and households have more money, then the expectation is that they're going to spend the money so there's more consumption. Expanded earned income tax credits, likewise, that is um, additional money for the lower income households, also increase consumption. Tuition tax credit, you or your dependents in college, you get additional tax credit, so there is more increased spending on the household portion. Business expensing tax breaks, so now you've got more business spending. So investment. Renewable energy tax credit was actually going to affect both the households and the businesses because households could do things like put more solar panels on their roofs or they could buy more energy efficient appliances, which would save them money in the long run and they get some money back now. So there was increased consumption, but then also businesses could similarly get tax credits for installing the solar panels or getting machinery that was more energy efficient. So you saw increase in business investment as well. So all of this says spending more, spending more, spending more. Spending is aggregate demand. So all these tax cuts are going to cause the aggregate demand to increase or shift to the right. Uh, the relief and self-help. This was trying to take care of the lowest income. This is your social safety net kind of stuff. Uh, welfare payments of three billion, supplemental social security income payments of four billion, uh, expanded unemployment insurance so you could stay on unemployment longer. 
all of these are looking at making sure that the lowest income households are going to have money to spend. So that's also aggregate demand. Okay, infrastructure spending. This one's interesting because, you know, clearly it's spending, so it's aggregate demand. It's a big bump in government spending where they spend $30 billion on highways and $20 billion on renovation of schools and health information technology, et cetera, et cetera. Accelerated deployment of broadband. All of these things fall under the category of increased government spending, right? The whole package is kind of an increased government spending, I suppose. But look at what they spent the money on. They didn't just say, hey, let's go spend money. They said, let's invest it in the future of our economy. Let's improve the highways so that we can deliver the goods and services more easily. Let's have school renovations so that education is improved. Let's improve health information technology so that our workers are more productive. Let's make sure we have better transportation and water. Um, we're going to have more construction, and we will have better Internet even in rural areas. So all of this is saying, let's target things that will make us more productive down the road. And productivity is supply side. So yes, there was money spent on these in aggregate demand rises, but they're spent on things that would make us more productive in the future. Okay, um, State and local government assistance, I'm not going to worry too much about because mostly what that did was filled in a hole. You know, all this money was draining out of the state economies and the federal government was just kind of dumping money in. So if they were lucky, they were maintaining and staying even. Energy efficiency projects, though, um, again, government spending on these projects, on grants, on electric grids. So this is all government spending, so aggregate demand. But it's government spending on stuff that will make us more productive in the future. So better energy sources, being more energy efficient, having other kinds of energy sources, all of that makes us more productive later. And if we're talking productivity, we're talking supply. So increase aggregate supply. And then this last one, human and intellectual capital. So let's have better education programs. Well, that better educated populace means more productivity later. Pell Grants, also for education. Better job training so people will become more productive. Scientific research, all of this investment in human and intellectual capital is spending by the government, but it's all things that are spending in order to make us more productive later, so increase aggregate supply down the road. So will this have expansionary effect or contractionary effect? And you, know, you can tell that it's increasing aggregate demand, increasing aggregate supply. Um, does this affect consumption, investment, government spending, net exports? If I flip back to the chart, I can see that it definitely affects consumption all over the place. Investment spending, the whole package is government spending. What I didn't see anywhere was net exports, and you know, maybe you guys find something that I don't, but frankly, it was a very domestically... Um, oriented kind of a package in a period where the entire world economy was tanking everybody said hey we're looking out for number one they weren't really worrying about what the other guy was doing they weren't saying hey make those guys spend money on our products so it wasn't about getting foreigners to spend more on our stuff which is what that X sector is the foreign sector spending money on our stuff it was about us domestically, our households, our businesses, our government spending. So in order to answer this one, you're going through and saying, do you think they're going up or down? And explain how you know. That is, pick at least one example from the stimulus plan to tell me what's happening. So for example, you would know that consumption, household spending, is going up because, and you can pick whichever one you want that causes that consumption to go up. Do the same for investment um, and government spending. So I'm just looking for a piece of evidence. You tell me which direction consumption changed and how you know, which direction investment sp changed and how you know, which direction government spending changed and how you know. Does the aggregate demand change? If so, does it go up or down? Does aggregate supply change? If so, does it go up or down? So you need to answer those for me. And then you're going to draw your fully labeled aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. So 
if I go back, I mean, it's not going to be a mystery to you. You've watched me go through all these aggregate demands rising, aggregate supplies rising. So if I come down here, that means that my aggregate demand, because all this extra spending, hopefully, is going on. It's not a very straight aggregate demand, but there you go. Aggregate demand increases. But because of the things that the money is being spent on, aggregate supply also increases. It's being invested into areas that increase productivity later. So we are looking at a new equilibrium that has a price level that's about the same as our old price level. So prices are staying stable. It has GDP that is higher than it was before. So my GDP has gone up. And if GDP has gone up, that means I get the growth. But I also get more jobs, so unemployment is dropping. So if my quantity is up, then that means I have more jobs and unemployment falls. Okay. So down here at the bottom, then, inflation will, well, it's not really going to change. Prices are going to remain stable. Unemployment will drop. Right? GDP will increase. I'll get positive growth. But the size of the deficit, man, this is definitely going to be changed. It's going to get much bigger because we said the deficit is how much are we overspending? So what is the gap between what we're spending and what we're bringing in in taxes? And what this whole package did was decreased the amount that was coming in in taxes and increased the amount that was going out in government spending. So if you look back at that sheet that I gave you on the previous page uh, with the U.S. data, you see a big jump from 2008 to 2009 in the size of the deficit. You do also see, though, over the next several years, it tapers off because all of these measures were meant to be temporary measures to kickstart the economy and then pull back. We didn't want to get the government in that business of that kind of spending forever and ever and ever. So it did come back down. All right, so... You should have plenty to go on to complete this particular homework assignment. Um, I'm going to take a look at some of the others now and see if there's anything else that I should be posting some help for you. So keep an eye out.